Chapter 5 of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston of Los Angeles, California. Henry D. Thoreau by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. Chapter 5 the transcendental period although henry thoreau would have been in any place or time of the world's drama a personage of note it has already been observed in regard to his career and his unique literary gift that they were affected and in some sort fashion by the influences of the very time and place in which he found himself at the opening of life. It was the sunrise of New England transcendentalism in which he first looked upon the spiritual world when Carlyle in England, Alcott, Emerson, and Margaret Fuller in Massachusetts were preparing their contemporaries in America for that modern renaissance which has been so fruitful for the last forty years in high thought vital religion pure literature and great deeds and the place of his birth and breeding the home of his affections as it was the troy the jerusalem and the rome of his imagination was determined by providence to be that very centre and shrine of transcendentalism the little village of concord which would have been saved from oblivion by his books, had it no other title to remembrance. Let it be my next effort, then, to give some hint, not a brief chronicle, of that extraordinary age, not yet ended, often as they tell us of its death and epitaph, now known to all men as the transcendental period we must wait for after times to fix its limits and determine its dawn and setting but of its apparent beginning and course one cycle coincided quite closely with the life of thoreau he was born in july eighteen seventeen when emerson was entering college at cambridge and Carlyle was wrestling with doubt, fear, unbelief, mockery, and scoffing in agony of spirit at Edinburgh. He died in May 1862, when the distinctly spiritual and literary era of transcendentalism had closed. Its years of preparation were over, and it had entered upon the conflict of political regeneration for which Thoreau was constantly sounding the trumpet. In these forty-five years, a longer period than the age of Pericles, or of the Medici, or of Queen Elizabeth, New England, transcendentalism rose, climbed, and culminated, leaving results that for our America must be compared with those famous eras of civilization. Those ages, in fact, were well-nigh lost upon us until Channing, Emerson, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, and their fellowship brought us into communication with the Greek, the Italian, and the noble Elizabethan revivals of genius and art. We have been living under the Puritan reaction modified and politically fashioned by the more humane philosophy of the 18th century while the freedom-breathing but half-barbarizing influences of pioneer life in a new continent had also turned aside the full force of English and Scottish Calvinism. It is common to trace the so-called transcendentalism of New England to Carlyle and Coleridge and Woodsworth in the mother country and to Goethe, Richter, and Kant in Germany and there is a certain outward affiliation of this sort which cannot be denied but that which in our spiritual soul gave root 
to the foreign seas thus wafted hitherward was a certain inward tendency of high calvinism and its counterpart quakerism always welling forth in the american colonies now it inspired cotton wheelwright sir harry vane and mistress ann hutchinson in massachusetts now william penn and his quaint brotherhood on the delaware now jonathan edwards and sarah pierpoint in connecticut and again john woolman the wandering friend of god and man in new jersey nicholas gilman the convert of whitefield in new hampshire and samuel hopkins the preacher of disinterested benevolence in rhode island held forth this noble doctrine of the inner light it is a gospel peculiarly attractive to poets so that even the loose girl davenant who would fain think himself the left-hand son of shakespeare told gossiping old aubrey that he believed the world after a while would settle into one religion an ingenuous quakerism that is a faith in divine communication that would yet leave some scope for men of wit like himself how truly these american calvinists and quakers prefigured the mystical part of concord philosophy may be seen by a few of their sayings jonathan edwards in seventeen twenty three when he was twenty years old and the fail saint of his adoration was fifteen thus wrote in his diary what he had seen and heard of sarah pierpont there is a young lady in new haven who is beloved of that great being who made and rules the world and there are certain seasons in which this great being in some way or other invisible comes to her and fills her mind with exceedingly sweet delight and she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him therefore if you present all the world before her with the riches of its treasures she disregards it and cares not for it and is unmindful of any pain or affliction she has a strange sweetness in her mind and a singular purity in her affections is most just and conscientious in all her conduct and you could not persuade her to do anything wrong or sinful if you would give her all the world least she should offend this great being she will sometimes go about from place to place singing sweetly and seems to be always full of joy and pleasure and no one knows for what she loves to be alone walking in the fields and groves and seems to have some one invisible always conversing with her nicholas gilman the parish minister of little durham in new hampshire being under concern of mind for his friend whitefield and the great man of new england at that time sir william pepperell just setting forth for the capture of louisburg wrote to them in march seventeen forty five to sir william thus do you indeed love the lord do you make the lord your guide and counsellor in ye affair if you have a soul great as that hero david of old you will ask of the lord and not go till he bid you david would not if you are sincerely desirous to know and do your duty in that and every other respect and seek of god in faith you shall know that and everything else needful one thing after another as fast as you are prepared for it but god will doubtless humble such as leave him out of their schemes as though his providence was not at all concerned in the matter whereas his blessing is all in all to whitefield gilman wrote in the same vein on the same day are you sufficiently sure that his call is from above that he was moved by the holy ghost to this expedition would it be no advantage to his estate to win the place 
may he not have a prospect of doubling his wealth and honors if crowned with success what demonstration has he given of being so entirely devoted to the lord he has a vast many talents is it an easy thing for so wise a man to become a fool for christ so great a man to become a little child so rich a man to crowd in at the straight gate of conversion and make so little noise if you see good to encourage the expedition be fully satisfied the project was formed in heaven was the lord first consulted in the affair did they wait for his counsel john woolman the new jersey quaker born in seventeen twenty died in seventeen seventy two said there is a principle which is pure placed in the human mind which in different places and ages hath had different names it is however pure and proceeds from god it is deep and inward confined to no forms of religion nor excluded from any when the heart stands in perfect sincerity in whomsoever this takes root and grows they become brethren that state in which every motion from the selfish spirit yieldeth to pure love i may acknowledge with gratitude to the father of mercies is often opened before me as a pearl to seek after that even the pious egotism and the laughable vagaries of transcendentalism had their prototype in the private meditations of the new england calvinists is well known to have such as have studied old diaries of the massachusetts ministers thus a minister of malden a successor of the awful michael wigglesworth whose alleged poem the day of doom as cotton mather thought might perhaps find our children till the day itself arrives in his diary for seventeen thirty five thus enters his trying experiences with a one-horse shay whose short life may claim comparison with that of the hundred-year masterpiece of dr holmes's deacon january thirty first bought a shay for twenty seven pounds ten shillings the lord grant it may be a comfort and blessing to my family march seventeen thirty five had a safe and comfortable journey to york april twenty fourth shay overturned with my wife and i in it yet neither of us much hurt blessed be our gracious preserver part of the shay as it lay upon one side went over my wife and yet she was scarcely anything hurt how wonderful the preservation may fifth went to the beach with three of the children the beast being frighted when we were all out of the shay overturned and broke it i desire i hope i desire it that the lord would teach me suitability to repent this providence to make suitable remarks on it and to be suitably affected with it have i done well to get me a shay have i not been proud or too fond of this convenience do I exercise the faith in the divine care and protection which I ought to do? Should I not be more in my study and less fond of diversion? Do I not withhold more than is meet from pious and charitable uses? May 15th. Shea brought home. Mending costs 30 shillings, favored in this beyond expectation. May 16th. My wife and I rode to Rumney Marsh, the beast frighted several times. At last this divine comedy ends with the pathetic conclusive line, June 4th, disposed of my shay to the Reverend Mr. White. I will not pause to dwell on the laughable episodes and queer characteristic features of the transcendental period, though such it had in abundance. They often served to correct the soberer absurdity with which our whole country was slipping unconsciously down the easy incline of national ruin and dishonor. 
from which only a bloody civil war could at last save us. Thoreau saw this clearly, and his political utterances, paradoxical as they seemed, in the two decades from 1840 to 1860 now read, like the words of a prophet, but there are some points in the American Renaissance which may here be touched on. So much light do they throw on the times. It was a period of strange face and singular apocalypses, that of Charles Foyer being one. In February 1843, Mr. Emerson, writing to Henry Thoreau from New York, where he was then lecturing, said, Mr. Brisbane has just given me a faithful hour and a half of what he calls his principles, and he shames truer men by his fidelity and zeal, and already begins to hear the reverberations of his single voice from most of the states of the Union. He thinks himself sure of W. H. Channing here as a good forerist. I laugh incredulous while he recites, for it seems always as if he was repeating paragraphs out of his master's book, descriptions of the self-augmenting potency of the solar system, which is destined to contain one hundred and thirty-two bodies, I believe, and his urgent inculcation of our stellar duties. But it has its kernel of sound truth, and its insanity is so wide of the New York insanities that it is virtue and honor. This was written a few months before Thoreau himself went to New York, and it was while there that he received from his friends in Concord and in Harvard the wondrous account of Mr. Alcott's paradise regained at Fruitlands, where, in due time, Thoreau made his visit and inspected that Garden of Eden on the Cold Spring Brook. If Mr. Brisbane had his stellar duties, and inculculated them in others, the Brook Farmers of 1842-43 had their planetary mission also, namely, to cultivate the face of the planet they inhabited, and to do it with their own hands, as Adam and Noah did of the brook farm enterprise much has been written and much more will be but concerning the more individual dream of thoreau's friends at fruitlands less is known and i may quote a few pages concerning it from thoreau's correspondence while thoreau was at staten island in eighteen forty three mr emerson wrote to him often giving the news of Concord as a transcendental capital. In May of that year, we have this intelligence. Ellery Channing is well settled in his house and works very steadily thus far, and our intercourse is very agreeable to me. Young Ball, B.W., has been to see me and is a prodigious reader and a youth of great promise, born, too, in the good town. Mr. Hawthorne is well, and Mr. Alcott and Mr. Lane are revolving a purchase in Harvard of ninety acres. This was Fruitlands, described in the Dial for 1843, and which Charles Lane himself describes in a letter soon to be cited in June 1843, Mr. Emerson again sends tidings from Concord, where the Fitchburg Railroad was then building. The town is full of Irish and the woods of engineers, with theodolite and red flag, singing out their feet and inches to each other from station to station. Near Mr. Alcott's, the Hosmer Cottage, the road is already begun. From Mr. A. and Mr. Lane at Harvard, we have yet heard nothing. They went away in good spirits, having sent Wood, Abram, and Larned, and William Lane before them with horse and plough, a few days in advance, 
to begin the spring work. Mr. Lane paid me a long visit, in which he was more than I had ever known him, gentle and open, and it was impossible not to sympathize with and honor projects that so often seem without feet or hands. They have near a hundred acres of land, which they do not want, and no house, which they want first of all. But they account this an advantage, as it gives them the occasion they so much desire, of building after their own idea, in the event of their attracting to their company a carpenter or two, which is not impossible. It would be a great pleasure to see their building, which could hardly fail to be new and beautiful. They have fifteen acres of woodland with good timber. Then, passing in a moment from Fruitlands to Concord Woods, Thoreau's friend writes, Ellery Channing is excellent company, and we walk in all directions. He remembers you with great faith and hope, thinks you ought not to see Concord again these ten years, that you ought to grind up fifty Concords in your mill, and much other opinion and counsel he holds in store on this topic. Hawthorne walked with me yesterday afternoon, and not until after our return did I read his Celestial Railroad, which has a serene strength we cannot afford not to praise in this low life. I have letters from Miss Fuller at Niagara. She found it sadly cold and raining at the falls. Not so with Mr. Alcott and Mr. Lane in the first flush of their hopes at Fruitlands on the ninth of June. The day of the letter just quoted being June 7th, Mr. Lane writes to Thoreau, Dear Friend, The receipt of two acceptable numbers of the Pathfinder reminds me that I am not altogether forgotten by one who, if not in the busy world, is at least much nearer to it externally than I am. Busy indeed, we all are since our removal here. But so recluse is our position that with the world at large we have scarcely any connection. You may possibly have heard that after all our efforts during the spring had failed to place us in connection with the earth, and Mr. Alcott's journey to Oriscani and Vermont had turned out a blank. One afternoon in the latter part of May, Providence sent to us the legal owner of a slice of the planet in this township, Harvard, with whom we have been enabled to conclude for the concession of his rights. It is very remotely placed, nearly three miles beyond the village, without a road, surrounded by a beautiful green landscape of fields and woods, with the distance filled up by some of the loftiest mountains in the state. The views are, indeed, most poetic and inspiring. You have no doubt seen the neighborhood, but from these very fields, where you may at once be at home and out, there is enough to love and revel in for sympathetic souls like yours. On the estate are about fourteen acres of wood, part of it extremely pleasant as a retreat, a very sylvan realization, which only wants a Thoreau's mind to elevate it to classic beauty. I have some imagination that you are not so happy and so well housed in your present position as you would be here amongst us, although at present there is much hard manual labor, so much that, as you perceive, my usual handwriting is very greatly suspended. We have only two associates in addition to our own families. Our house accommodations are poor and scanty, but the greatest want is of good female aid. 
far too much labor dissolves on mrs alcott if you should light on any such assistance it would be charitable to give it a direction this way we may perhaps be rather particular about the quality but the conditions will pretty well determine the acceptability of the parties without a direct adjudication on our part for though to me our mode of life is luxurious in the highest degree yet generally it seems to be thought that the setting aside of all impure diet dirty habits idle thoughts and selfish feelings is a course of self-denial scarcely to be encountered or even thought of in such an alluring world as this in which we dwell besides the busy occupations of each succeeding day we form in this ample theatre of hope many forthcoming scenes the nearer little copse is designed as the site of the cottages fountains can be made to descend from their granite sources on the hill slope to every apartment if required gardens are to displace the warm grazing glades on the south and numerous human beings instead of cattle shall here enjoy existence though fatherwood offers to the naturalist and the poet an exhaustless haunt and a short cleaning of the brook would connect our boat with the nashua such are the designs which mr alcott and i have just sketched as resting from planting we walked round this reserve in your intercourse with the dwellers in the great city have you alighted on mr edward palmer who studies with dr beach the herbalist he will i think from his previous nature love and his affirmations to mr alcott be animated on learning of this actual wooing and winning of nature's regards we should be most happy to see him with us having become so far actual from the real we might fairly enter into the typical if he could help us in any way to types of the true metal we have not passed away from home to see or hear of the world's doings but the report has reached us of mr w h channing's fellowship with the philanesterians and of his eloquent speeches in their behalf their progress will be much aided by his accession to both these worthy men be pleased to suggest our humanist sentiments while they stand amongst men it is well to find them acting out the truest possible at the moment just before we heard of this place mr alcott had projected a settlement at the cliffs on the concord river cutting down wood and building a cottage but so many more facilities were presented here that we quitted the old classic town for one which is to be not less renowned as far as i could judge our absence promised little pleasure to our old concord friends but at signs of progress i presume they rejoice with dear friend yours faithfully charles lane another palmer than the edward here mentioned became an inmate of fruitlands and in course of time its owner the abandoned paradise which was held by mr lane and mr alcott for less than a year is now the property of his son mr lane after a time returned to england and died there mr alcott to concord where in eighteen forty five he aided thoreau in building his hut by walden mr channing the nephew and biographer of dr channing continued his connection with the foul and Starians in new jersey until eighteen forty nine or later for in that year frederica bremer found him dwelling and preaching among them at the north american phalanstery to which he had been invited from his unitarian parish in cincinnati about the time that brook farm was made a community and before mr alcott's dream had taken earthly shape at fruitlands the account given 
by Miss Beamer of the terms upon which Mr. Channing was thus invited to New Jersey show what was the spirit of transcendentalism then on its social side they said to him come to us be our friend and spiritual shepherd but in perfect freedom follow your own inspiration preach talk to us how and when it appears best to you we undertake to provide for your pecuniary wants live free from anxiety how and where you will but teach us how we should live and work our homes and our hearts are open to you it was upon such terms as this honorable alike to those who gave and those who received that much of the intellectual and spiritual work of the transcendental revival was done there was another and an unsocial side to the movement also which mr emerson early described in these words that apply to thoreau and to alcott at one period it is a sign of our times conspicuous to the coarsest observer that many intelligent and religious persons withdraw themselves from the common labors and competitions of the market and the caucus and betake themselves to a solitary and critical way of living from which no solid fruit has yet appeared to justify their separation they hold themselves aloof they feel the disproportion between themselves and the work offered them and they prefer to ramble in the country and perish of ennui to the degradation of such charities and such ambitions as the city can propose to them they are striking work and crying out for somewhat worthy to do they are lonely the spirit of their writing and conversation is lonely they repel influences they shun general society they incline to shut themselves in their chamber in the house to live in the country rather than in the town and to find their tasks and amusements in solitude they are not good citizens not good members of society unwillingly they bear their part of the public and private burdens they do not willingly share in the public charities in the public religious rites in the enterprise of education of missions foreign or domestic in the abolition of the slave trade or in the temperance society they do not even like to vote the philanthropists inquire whether transcendentalism does not mean sloth they had as lieth here that their friend is dead as that he is a transcendentalist for then is he paralyzed and can do nothing for humanity it was this phase of transcendentalism that gave most anxiety to thoreau's good old pastor dr ripley who early foresaw what immediate fruit might be expected from this fair tree of mysticism this burning bush which had started up all at once in the very garden of his parsonage i know few epistles more pathetic in their humility and concern for the future than one which dr ripley addressed to dr channing in february eighteen thirty nine after hearing and meditating on the utterances of alcott emerson thoreau george ripley and the other apostles of the newness who disturbed with their oracles the quiet air of his parish he wrote denied as i am the privilege of going from home of visiting and conversing with enlightened friends and of reading even broken down with the infirmities of age and subject to fits that deprive me of reason and the use of my limbs i feel it a duty to be patient and submissive to the will of god who is too wise to err and too good to injure some reason is left my mental powers though weak are yet awake and i long to be doing something for good the contrast between paper and ink is so strong that i can write better than do anything else in this way i take the liberty to express to you a few thoughts which you will receive 
as well meant and sincere we may certainly assume that whatever is unreasonable self-contradictory and destitute of common sense is erroneous should we not be likely to find the truth in all moral subjects were we to make more use of plain reason and common sense i know that our modern speculators transcendentalists or as they prefer to be called realists presume to follow reason in her purest dictates her sublime and unfrequented regions they presume by her power not only to discover what is truth but to judge of revealed truth but is not their whole process marred by leaving out common sense by which mankind are generally governed that superiority which places a man above the power of doing good to his fellow man seems to me not very desirable i honor most the man who transcends others in capacity and disposition to do good and whose daily practice corresponds with his profession here i speak of professed christians i would not treat with disrespect and severe censure men who advance sentiments which i may neither approve nor understand provided their authors be men of learning piety and holy lives the speculations and novel opinions of such men rarely prove injurious nevertheless i would that their mental endowments might find a better method of doing good a more simple and intelligible manner of informing and reforming their fellow men the hope of the gospel is my hope my consolation support and rejoicing such is my state of health that death is constantly before me no minute would it be unexpected i am waiting in faith and hope but humble and penitent for my imperfections and faults the prayer of the publican god be merciful to me a sinner is never forgotten i have hoped to see and converse with you but now despair if you shall think i use too much freedom with you charge it to the respect and esteem which are cherished for your character by your affectionate friend and brother e ripley concord february twenty sixth eighteen thirty nine at this time dr ripley was almost eighty eight and he lived two years longer to mourn yet more pathetically over the change of times and manners it was fit said emerson that in the fall of laws this loyal man should die but the young men who succeeded him were no less loyal to the unwritten laws and from their philosophy which to the old theologian seemed so misty and unreal there flowered forth in due season the most active and world-wide philanthropies twenty years after this pastoral epistle there came to concord another christian of the antique type more puritan and hebraic than dr ripley himself yet a transcendentalist too and john brown found no lack of practical good will in thoreau alcott emerson and the other transcendentalists the years had come full circle the sibyl had burnt her last prophetic book and the new aeon was about to open with the downfall of slavery end of chapter five recording by jill preston of los angeles california